Welcome back, everyone. So we are in the final session of the day, final session of the week. <clears throat> We're going to do a tutorial session on whole brain modeling. And there's so so for those of you who've been to the repo and checked it out, I've I've been a, a little bit a, a little bit generous um, for you guys. Is there's actually so well? Let me let me bring up my browser so I can kind of show you what I'm talking about here. Um, as always, questions in the question box, please, folks. And um, maybe we can engender some discussion around some of the things that we're going to be covering here. Now, um, I'm going to be sharing my screen. OK. <clears throat> so in the in the lessons repo, day five folder of the lessons repo, as before. Again, you can open in Colab or you can run it locally. And for the for this session, what we're going to be doing, we're going to focus on um, just one of these tutorials, which is um, a um, a tutorial that I put together that follows on from the emphases that we had in the previous the the previous lecture about the Janssen RIT model and some of the ways that um, uh, oscillatory generation um, within those circuits. W what I've added, which is actually like an additional relative to last year, is a second tutorial here. Now, this this is something that we can. It's kind of an optional. Um, so I say it's kind of an added added uh, value for you guys. So you can you can kind of check this out in your own time and just work through it. It's fairly kind of well documented and self explanatory. Maybe we can touch on it in this session today. Depends how quickly we move through the first one and how keen people are to jump into a, another tutorial as well. So we'll, we'll kind of play that one by ear uh, in in a little bit. Um, but like briefly, the the difference or that the the second one is about um, <clears throat> models of resting state fMRI connectivity, and we haven't actually I intentionally didn't include so much of that in the in the talk because it was a pretty packed talk as it was but it's uh yeah it's implementing a fairly like well-known um model and kind of theory for the generation of um functional connectivity patterns in fMRI takes quite a long time to run though that one um so we, you wouldn't want to be we wouldn't be able to run the simulations um in the session the first, the first one, which we'll be focusing on, we'll be able to run everything within the session because things are fairly quick to run. So um, let me proceed. Uh, I'm going to be running this one locally. So I have a Jupyter Notebook up here. Um, I'm going to head back to the top. So whole brain modeling tutorial session one and uh, oscillations, stimulation, and some network stuff as well. Bear with me one second while I get access to the chat in case I need to see it. Okay, good. Uh, so <clears throat> we're going to take a look at the, uh, we, we're going to follow through something fairly similar to what we've done conceptually in the, uh, in the, in the lecture previously, which is think about the components of a um, whole brain model. First, in terms of the the atomic units, I used the phrase previously, and then in terms of the network structure. And then uh, to, to wrap up, we're going to look at this idea of injecting stimulation and looking at stimulated propagation patterns. So first, I'm running this locally. Um, if people are running it on Google Colab, then you need to uncomment, do these pip install things. As we've discussed previously, um, the two libraries for in terms of the, the computational modeling stuff are these two 
components of the TVB library. Uh, also doing some visualizations with Nylearn, actually doing some visualizations with MoviePy. And I think I have Fief in here, but I think we're not using it. But it's uh, definitely kind of a callback to extensive foof, foof demonstration yesterday. But we can certainly do foof analysis for these uh, power spectra that we'll be generating. So <clears throat> we'll do some imports. Uh, <laughs> this thing here is something I had to do to deal with variations in the API, the TBB API. It's very annoying if you have a software tool that makes like even minor changes to the way that the the API, the application programming interface, the way you call the functions. TBB made this change where you had to give things as arrays and previously they didn't. So so this this little thing here is a kind of a helper function that I wrote that helps with a very small part of that. Uh, I have a custom surface visualization function, which, which might be interesting to people to actually take a look at. If I'm interested in just like how do you plot a surface, um, purely a map plot lib. Um, but this this function does a few things slightly better than the nylon visualization function, which uh, Aaron showed you a little bit of here. Now, the model that we're going to be using, we talked about it a fair bit already, is the Janssen RIP model. And um, this was introduced in this paper and also an earlier one in 1993 by these two guys, Ben Janssen and Vincent Ritt. And they were building on work going back to the 1970s by um, some folks in the uh, in Netherlands, particularly Fernando Lopez de Silva and um, and uh, Lars Zetterberg, uh, who uh, introduced a early version of this uh, wave to pulse, pulse to wave convolutional neural mass model that we, we looked at earlier on. Um, and this model, the Janssen RIP model, so the the 95 paper is focusing on these things, visual potentials or ERPs, evoke responses. Um, the 93 one is focusing on uh, rhythms, but they both they kind of both do a bit of both. This was this has been pretty influential, actually, and particularly uh, Cal Friston and Co. Kind of adopted this as the uh, the workhorse model for um, their physiological models with the uh, dynamic causal modeling. Andreas Spiegler, who one of the architects of TVB, has also done some interesting theory work. It's one of the main models that are, that's used in the field, um, for better or worse. Um, so we saw this a version of the schematic earlier on. But to repeat, we have a one, uh, so two excitatory neural populations. One is a pyramidal cell population, one is a, an excitatory interneuron population, and one is an inhibitory interneuron population. And the inhibitory population inhibits the pyramidal cell, where and the excitatory interneuron population um, excites the pyramidal cell population, but these two don't talk to each other. That's the basic uh, motif structure. <clears throat> um, the wiring diagram on the right is showing um, these uh, these um, wave to pulse and pulse to wave um, conversions that we talked about here. So the S of V is the sigmoid function. Uh, so so these are the model equations. Again, we get these coupled pairs, these these couples of um, a uh, a excuse me um, a first order um, ordinary differential equation. So, well, a second order ordering differential equation that we split into two. So these two, these two guys um, together make up. Well, you, you can kind of rewrite this pair as a second order differential equation that has some kind of second derivatives. Well, that has a, that has a second derivative on the left hand side and has a first derivative on the right hand side. Um, but um, it's con it's convenient when you're doing simulations with ODEs to with differential equations to just um, do this extra modification where you introduce this auxiliary variable. Don't you guys don't need to know the details of this, but it's good to kind of see the equations for the systems you're working with. Again, with the sigmoid, so we have this, you know, sigmoid. Sigmoids typically have 
something like a one over e to the something. That's um, uh, that's that's like what the basic structure of a sigmoid function is. So we have the um, sigmoid parameters here. We're listing the um, the um, what these terms correspond to in relation to the equations here. So good. Let's crack on. So I think I've run all the cells previously to here. So we're just going to quickly, first thing we do is we initialize a model with TVB. Let's take a look at what that does. It returns this model object, JRM mod. Um, has a load of stuff in it. Um, but why don't we just quickly inspect it? So we get this uh, output to the command line. We don't ask for anything. We can list the parameter values. So these uh, coupling parameters, the A parameters, there's uh, the time constants, which is, uh, let's say tau, but it's clearly not tau. Um, what is the time cost? Uh, the rate constant for the answer rate. Let's just back up a sec. It's going to be Yeah, your big A's and your little A's. Good. So all these parameters here, we can we can um, can view them in our returned object, and uh, some other useful methods that um, we can look at. What we're going to do first is um, is run a, a single node simulation. So we're going to not going to think about connectivity, large scale connect terms, etc. There's a a useful method that comes with our uh, model object. Called stationary trajectory, which we don't know, you don't need to know the details of, but this kind of lets us run the simulation. So, uh, what I've got here is a simple function that just kind of does. Um, there's there's basically like two lines here that are relevant is initialize the model given the parameters that we tell it in a dictionary here, a dictionary expansion with the two asterisks here. This uh, lets you kind of give keyword arguments from a from a dictionary input and then this thing this is run the simulation the rest of it's just stick it in a data frame as we often do and also compute the power spectrum and stick that in a data frame and then return those things but this this is this is very minimal and there's just two important lines here within this function it's not a complicated function so we're going to run this it gives us these two things back again it's the time series and the uh the power spectrum. So we take a quick look. Um, so that's what, so we've got uh, for one single node, six state variables. Um, six state variables. The current of the pyramidal cell population, so PN, pyramidal neuron, EIN, excitatory interneuron, IAN, inhibitory interneuron. We have current C and the voltage V. Okay, so we've got six um, six state variables, uh, and we've gone into DFYs is the time series for each of those. So if we just take a quick look at these, um, what we've got here. So one thing, and this was this is mentioned earlier on. Um, so yesterday in the in the tutorial demonstrations as well, running a simulation <laughs> when you're working with numerical simulations. Um, something that you see quite often, unless unless you are doing quite specific things with initial conditions where you know what you're doing, um, what you'll typically see when you crunch through time and generate simulated activity is something like this at the start. This is what we call a, a transient, so it's a, a kind of settling behavior. So we 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 what we do with with TVB is we kind of choose random initial conditions. Um, uh, within some range of the state variables that kind of is uh, we, we specify the limits of, but the <clears throat> the when, whenever you are doing work with these these kind of models, not just neural models, but differential equation models in general, you'll have some period of time where there's some uh, like non-physical, non-physiological um, behavior that that settles. So we call this the transient. In this case, the transient is persisting for around about uh, 100 milliseconds. 
we we'll see it in the yeah, in all, all three of the all three of these variables, particularly in the inhibitory interneuron one. But um, once you've so so we want to we just what you want to do uh, when you're running these kind of models is you you run for a certain period of time and then you need to figure out it's basically a manual process when the transient is finished and then you start looking at stuff from that point onwards we ignore the transient sometimes it's called a burn-in period um, so in this case the transient's kind of done after about 200 milliseconds so we can you can think we can focus on time after that and that's what I'm doing actually here in the um, in the third of these plots. so the first one is plotting our uh, full simulation which is uh, two and a half seconds, 2,500 milliseconds. The second plot is just plotting the first 500 milliseconds, so it's like here to here, right? So that's what our second row is, just emphasizing the, the transient there. And then if we, and then the third plot is actually plotting from 500 onwards or 500 to, um, yeah, to 1,500. And, the point here is like, well, you can see here is now you can see some oscillatory activity. That's there in the above plots, but it's just completely dwarfed by the transient. So you kind of, if if all if all you look when you do a plot and you use the kind of automatic scaling that plotting functions typically do, if all you do is plot the first x many you know milliseconds of simulation, then what you're going to see is transient, and often you'll see nothing else, and you're like, okay, there's nothing going on you need to just ignore the transient and then readjust, say, your scaling from whenever you're going to choose as your starting point. And when we do that, we actually do see that there's this oscillatory behavior that you know, clearly we can't see um, if we don't cut off the first bit. So, yeah, we ignore the transients. Um, the, also, these different populations, they're doing stuff at different magnitudes. So this figure here is just showing that this blue line here, which is the uh, the um, the, is it the pyramidal cell population, yeah, the blue line here. So if you if we looked at it here, you can just about see it, but it looks like it's kind of flatlining. Um, if we just normalize the variables, or in this case, I'm normalizing the variables by plotting the the pyramidal cell population on a on a secondary axis, then we can see that actually there's exactly the same oscillatory rhythm. Um, in the pyramidal cells, yeah, exactly the same oscillatory rhythm um, in all three populations, with some lag between them, which is kind of what we expect because the you know, activity is moving between our populations with a little bit of a delay. That's the the delay associated with the synaptic response, principally. So yeah, we have our oscillatory activity in all three populations. Um, and what we can do is look at, as I was emphasizing before, the role of the negative feedback loops. So what I'm showing here is three is the same same model, but for three three different levels of um, of uh, Three, three different values of the of these uh, connectivity parameters, these local circuit connectivity parameters, and these are these being shown in the legends on the on the x-axis. <clears throat> so, the number to pay attention to is the inhibitory interneuron to pyramidal cell, okay, which is this I and P N that we're just listing in the legend here. So when that inhibitory feedback is zero, then we're getting no oscillations. But when we get, when we set that inhibitory feedback up a bit, then we start to see oscillations. So this is a, yeah, just a kind of quick demonstration that you, you need to have um, an inhibitory feedback in order to generate the oscillatory activity. Um, the frequency of activity depends on a number of things, but two, two of the key things that determine um, the frequency of activity in these kind of models, and I, I would say in dynamic models in general, is the are uh, these two things: the the time constants and the connectivity parameters or the connectivity like input weights. So, doing a similar kind of thing, we're going to 
loop through and just take a look at um, a few different simulation runs and take a look at the emergence of oscillations and the frequency at which we see the oscillations. Okay, so we've got the time series on the right hand side, we've got a power spectrum on, sorry, time series on the left hand side, we've got a power spectrum on the right hand side, and um, we're seeing in the, well, see, seeing in the left hand side, we're kind of moving through what we call a hot bifurcation where we're going from a quiescent stable state even after you ignore the transient. Um, into eventually into this self-sustained oscillation. This guy here in the middle would be um, like en route to the self-sustained oscillation because you have a damped, dying, exponentially decaying uh, oscillatory waveform there. Um, but we're moving through, yeah, so we're moving through these regimes, like no oscillations, damped oscillation, uh, undamped oscillation, and Again, it's the, um, so in this case, we're changing the uh, the connectivity and the time constant parameters, which are being shown, well, these are the numbers that we're iterating through here. The one that's changing is this one in the middle, this middle column. Um, and that middle column is you know, one to, is your, your third um, parameter, which is going in as A3, so A3. All of these, all of these parameters, parameter inputs are the same and your A3 is uh, changing just across this 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 minimal set of four different um, four different parameter combinations and that actually has quite a profound effect on the oscillatory patterns in the system and we can see it in the in this uh, emergence of an oscillatory activity in general, but also the, the frequency of the oscillatory activity, because for our um, our damped wave here, damped oscillation here, the frequency of the actual damped oscillation is around about 10 hertz, you can see in the peak here. But for our sustained oscillation here, the frequency of the oscillation is around about 6 hertz, at least according to our, our power spectrum here. Um, and uh, Yeah, and this oscillation, these things are changing as a function of, we can just see it here, so the EIN to PIN, you see in the legend, it's going up, right? So that's uh, that's one of those connection wiring strengths. So as you crank up the, um, the, the connectivity from the excitatory population into the neuron population to the pyramidal cell, then we're actually changing both the if you like the excitability level of this um, of this node, and at least relative from here to here, we're changing the dominant oscillatory frequency as well. Which starts off at 10 hertz and then drops down to five hertz-ish here. This uh, back and forth between a oscillation, a preferred oscillation at around 10 hertz and a preferred oscillation around 4 hertz, that's a well understood feature of this uh, Janssen RIP model. It's kind of something you see in papers quite a lot. So the signal coupling function we talked about, we can view it in, um, or we can pull it out of TVB and take a look at it. I don't want to um, dwell on it too much, but just, just kind of show you, you know, I, I talked a fair bit about the, sig the role of the sigmoid before. So the sigmoid is here with us. And um, uh, well, we can we can easily plot it as a as scatter plot. Now, now, we, now we're going to think about a network. We're going to think about a network, and we're going to think about the connectivity and the connectome side of things. Um, we've done a lot of visualization of connectivity and connectomes so far today, which is great because you've got a lot of foundation for what I'm going to show you next. Um, First thing is we're going to plot the connectivity weights and the conduction delays. I haven't emphasized conduction delays yet, but a key, um, again, another com component of these type of models is this, uh, or an, an assumption, uh, is that the speed of propagation from one part of the brain to another part of the brain is not infinite, in this, uh, which means it's not infinite, infinitely fast. And so, for long fibers, um, we expect there to be some delay, some conduction delay. 
Uh, so that that delay is something that we try and estimate from the tractography information because we have the an estimate of the fiber uh, axonal the connectivity length from that axonal fiber bundle, which is not a straight line. It's like a you know generally like a convoluted you know, wiggle. So we have the track length, and we try to we use a um, a guess at what the velocity is, and um, this gives us a matrix of conduction delays. So. So just kind of plotting um, plotting this connectivity here. Again, it's a seaborne heat map for connectivity that we've seen before. And again, one of the uh, one of the things I've emphasized is and really comes out in this connectivity matrix, which is based on the um, on CocoMac actually. Is we have a uh, top left left hemisphere intrahemispheric hem left uh, hemisphere connections. So it's uh, right hemisphere here, some um, flip for some reason, it doesn't matter so much. Intrahemispheric right hemisphere connections, intrahemispheric left he hemisphere connections in the bottom left block, and then cross hemispheric um, left, um, cross hemispheric connections between left and right in these secondary diagonals. So even though our uh, CocoMac derived um, uh, like TVB connectivity is uh, um, is kind of let's say complicated because it's coming from non-human primate data. Principally, we still have the presence of this particularly recognizable feature, which is uh, some connection strength between hemispheric homologs. Um, we can plot. So I was talking about conduction delays a little bit, and we can talk, we can um, also plot those as a matrix, which we're gonna do here. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, so left hemisphere, right hemisphere connections, cross hemispheric connections, and then conduction delays associated with each of these um, and the in this figure, the the lower values, like the black values, those indicate a low delay, right? And a low delay would be what you would get from a very high speed and potentially a very short distance as well. But we know we don't have short distances, so we have low delays for um, for quite a, a fair number, a fair amount of this matrix, that is like the dark, the dark black color. That's give that's a low delay, um, as in a fast, fast um, propagation. So, two things that we see is uh, one like low delay along the main diagonal, which isn't super surprising. But the other thing is low delay along this vestige of the secondary diagonal in the. Um, in the cross hemispheric connectivity. Um, again, this is the dark values in this plot, uh, giving us um, giving us that those uh, connections that are um, that are fast. I mean, that's what we mean by a low delay. Okay, so with that, after thinking about connectivity a bit, I want to quickly come back and think about the. The um, the brain that we're getting this from and what it means, what the nodes mean, etc. So one of the things that we want to know when we're saying, okay, these are um, uh, networks that give you um, connectivity or that give you um, activity for a given node, is um, Uh, is that is that those 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 nodes those those brain region parcels they they they're coming from a certain location in space and we can actually kind of define that quite easily with the, with the centroids and with some some quick scatter plots like this. Now. Um, so we have. We have these uh, these center um, 
variables that we've grabbed from the current activity. Um, now let's initiate our connectivity object and make a plot. So what we're plotting here is, excuse me, what we're plotting here is um, a surface mesh. So this is a surface visualization, which um, we've already seen before um, Aaron was describing these. And we're coloring the nodes, that, the, the labels within the surface mesh according to um, the, I think it's a categorical value right now. RM equals regmap, okay. Yeah, so this, this is a bit like the parcellation image that we had before. So we're gonna have like, a, a un, ideally a unique color for every, um, every brain parcellation that we're using here. But our surface plot, um, nothing else really to add about the surface plot. Um, this is the Nylon equivalent. So the difference between the big plotting function that I had at the top and uh, Nylon, which we'll see in a minute, but I can start telling you at least, is um that if you're not using Nylon regularly, then it might seem uh, like overkill to use it specifically for visualization and not for analysis. I, I specifically use Nylon for visualization rather than analysis and for particularly for quick visualization, producing quick visualizations. Um, it's really nice to have a, a, a um, well-organized function that you can just kind of pull and run, and um, it'll give you good good visualizations with relatively little effort. So we have our surface plot. Uh, this ROI plot. This will take ages to run because I just run plot surface ROI for ages. Um, Right, so what we can do, thinking about the network structure as well, again, is um, is take the numbers in the connectivity matrix, actually plot them directly on the brain, on the cortical surface. And what that would do would to give you a brain region that has an intensity that says something, roughly speaking, how many connections it has. That's what the intensity would um, would indicate. So this is easily done, and this is um, easily done. Not exactly what we're doing in the next uh, thing at all. Uh, on RE1 here. is showing the uh, activity levels for everything falling within this parcel, con RA1. I want to know is how many, how many regions does con A1 uh, project to? And what I think this is telling us is that it's projecting to and like just around, around 20, 20, 20 non-zero projections for this specific thing. So we can take a look at that. First, I'll just run that uh, surface visualization again. So um, con RE1 on here would be, bear with me a second.
So this should work. I think we should be able to just do the following on our A1. Supposing it looks like this. I do. Uh... That. Yeah, I'm having a brain fart right now, guys. So I'm gonna, gonna move on before I embarrass myself too much further. Um, so what we're looking at here is uh, the um, uh, so we we I'm I'm showing by creating an array of zeros and. Uh, and sticking a one at one of those locations. I'm just using that as a device for showing the location of one of our one of our parcels. So that's what I did here. So I just created a, an array of zeros and I stuck a one at one location. This is this is uh, where we're gonna actually implement some brain stimulation in a minute. So just before we actually run the brain stimulation, if I just uh, stick a one at that location, and then plot this with the function below, then the area that we're seeing, the red patch there, that's the um, that's the vertices in the in the surface that fall within the region that has the label um, has the label five. Okay, so this is these are our uh, LPFCCL nodes. Now, um, next thing for thinking about stimulation is this thing called the stimulus waveform. And uh, basically, there's a nice uh, plotting utility in TVB for doing this. So we have uh, time uh, on on this bottom this. Uh, image on the bottom left and uh, space kind of on the top left and also it's kind of space on the right hand side so all this these things are showing is that <clears throat> over over space in other words over voxels so over parcels in our connectivity there's one parcel that has a non-zero value kind of we, we kind of know that already and in terms of time we're gonna wait up until 1500 milliseconds and then inject a brief pulse that's what the the stimulation is looking like here. So I'm gonna run this and take a look at the outputs. So we had our um, simulation running function where we say how long we're gonna do it for and then give the parameters. And then this second line is just a, a way of um, a way of me defining some variable names. So so we're going to have the time series and the um, and the power spectrum for each of the each of the populations. The time series is going to be EFCPN. As we see, so I've got up to four thousand seconds. If I maybe just want to plot a little bit of that, let's uh, say one thousand, and maybe up to five columns. Here we go. That's our uh, our time series for our um, 
our parameter neuron current variables. So, so we ran this up here. So this is giving us our neural activity. And then what I'm doing here is plotting plotting the neural activity uh, resulting from the brain stimulation. So plotting, plot, plotting the activity level um, in the network after the stimulation input, plotting that as a surface plot as we've seen already. So what that's doing is it's starting out here um, in the in the left hemisphere in the, at the stimulation site, which we showed before, this is kind of what we expect. And then over the course of a couple of uh, milliseconds, a couple of hundred milliseconds, we have this gradual propagation outwards. So stimulate basically high response at our stimulated region for a little while, and then we propagate outwards. And often in other models, but not this one, we propagate cross hemispherically as well. We can look at this in a slightly more jazzy way, which is rather than as a sequence of stills in those plots above, um, we just plot it as a GIF. So that's what we're doing here. Um, the the magic source I've found for um, doing generating uh, movies for representing data is to um, save, to kind of loop through, get your PNG plot or whatever of the um, activity, the thing that you want to plot changing, and then change the thing right within a loop. So what we're doing here is um, is we're, yeah, we're looping through three different valleys of this, uh, this T delay, okay? Still running, so it took a little bit of time to run. Um, we could look at this one a little bit while we're waiting. So stimulus comes in. When we inject the stimulus into the into this region, this region goes through the roof, as as perhaps you can imagine. We can put put, put it through a sigmoid, which we, we should be doing. Um, but as it stands, we inject activity into here, and the first thing that happens is activity is huge in this region. Then we look at the activity spreading, and um, and the, just in general the spatiotemporal pattern of the of this um, stimulation induced. Uh, neural activity pattern. So yeah, okay. So the, the the GIF is quite helpful, I think, for thinking about this. It's like the when we inject, when we insert the stimulus, it goes basically pitch black here um, in the stimulated parcel, and that's because the I, I think it's likely that the um, the state variable here is just hitting hitting top level. And I, can't be sustained at its um, maximum maximum uh, input. But anyway, yeah. So we we poke it, and you know this is this is we're working towards this being a reasonable way of formulating a simulation of um, TMS TEPs, right? It's like temporal te spatial temporal patterns of uh, of activity waves following uh, um, stimulation pulse in the frontal lobe. So our simulation gives us some of this this uh, propagation pattern, and um, that's actually. I mean, I moved super quickly. I moved a lot quickly, more quickly than last time. Finally, we can actually see the propagation pattern as well in the in this uh, heat map here, and it's just um, uh, it's things like the like roughly this kind of diagonal here. So we see that there's some. Uh, some activity, some evoked activity that is uh, going in at the input node, and then a certain point is hitting these other ones, and then it's spreading, and then hitting these other ones, and then it's spreading, and so on. So that's what we see. You can see things like uh, a uh, what we call a wave front or a, um, a traveling wave of stimulus activity quite nicely in uh, in two D heat map plots like this.
Um, yeah, so there's our, our simulated stimulation propagation there as well. Again, <clears throat> so um, I'm taking a look at the chat. No questions up yet. A bit of uh, German spiel from Shreyas, which is, uh, you know, it's great. Good, good on you. And yeah, no questions yet. So this is our forking point, guys. This is the bit where we could talk a bit more about this, or we could go to the second tutorial, which could take a fair bit of time to get through. Um, any any thoughts from the crowd on those two options? It's, uh, it's half past three, so we're getting up to our finish time. I am quite tired myself, but I'm prepared to prepared to follow the, the preferences of the group. So just just write in the chat like you're okay, you get the gist, you're done for now. You wanna do the resting state tutorial, resting state fMRI tutorial. Do you want me to talk about something else? Um, you have any questions from any of the stuff we've talked about so far? I know I moved pretty quickly. Uh, there's not, um, yeah, not, not kind of knocking down the doors for any of these options. So, I'm gonna, I'm gonna propose uh, an early finish, if uh, if there's no one in the next say thirty seconds who shouts to do the resting tutorial. Okay, we got one. Aaron wants to see the fMRI tutorial. Okay. All right, Aaron, let's do it. Let's do it. We'll do it quickly. I think I think there's a way of doing it quickly, actually, that I prepared, which involves not running certain things. So let's let's take that approach. Okay, I'm going to open up the notebook for the next one. Still keep the questions coming in, guys. Oh, we had a question. <laughs> question about uh, what are connectivity eigenvectors and harmonic brain modes? Um, this is a super good question. What's the best way of thinking about it? Um, well, we can start with connectivity eigenvectors. I'm going to go back to... Well, where, which connectivity eigenvector should we look at? Why don't we Why don't we start with this one? Yeah, we'll start with this one. Um, now we'll use this one. Okay, so connectivity eigenvector is I can procedurally define a connectivity eigenvector for you very straightforwardly. So we have our connect connectivity here. So con dot weights. Okay, that's a connectivity matrix. Uh, we've seen it several times before, but it looks like this. Um, now, uh, basically, a connectivity eigenvector is the connectivities. It's the eigenvectors of the connectivity matrix. So, just use our standard NumPy function for getting those out of here. Okay, so. Um, when you when you grab eigenvalues and eigenvectors from linear algebra uh, functions, these are the right way around. Yeah, I did. Um, there's our eigenvalues. Yep, there's our eigenvectors. Uh, let's take a look at some of the eigenvectors. The way to think about them is to plot them on the surface. So if we take our surface plot 
thing from here and say so if that equals evex all zero so that's our first eigenvector and then this should okay but why does that not work axis Complex, that's easily solved. All right, now we just have color scaling to figure out, so what is the values of that? I don't know if you are wanting such a big combination, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll start talking in a minute, and you know, I'll, um, I'll explain what I'm showing you. So. We just need to get the colors for this. I'm going to use a big red color map. So let's do uh, the BU. And then let's choose our minimax to be, say, minus 0 0.25 and 0 0.05, I think that'll be a good one. Uh, kind of, it probably do. So let me start explaining what I'm talking, what I'm doing here. Um, do this one. So this is the first connectivity eigenvector. This is the second connectivity eigenvector. Third connectivity eigenvector. The uh, stuff like I could do a better job on the covers there. Is it the sounder that's doing that? I'm not too happy about that. Is that alpha? V min of Vmax. The thing for It's a little bit better, but I need to get the orientation. Um, UV equals apple. This is our first eigenvector. I'm just plotting it. This is our second eigenvector. So I need to put this down. First eigenvector. Second eigenvector. Yep, this is better. This is better. Okay. Third eigenvector. And then we'll think about what we just did. Are you still with us, Justin? Maybe I'll start. Maybe I'll click answer 
on the question thing. Uh, so, so the question was from Justin. He was curious what are connectivity eigenvectors and harmonic brain modes, and um, I went off on one, um, doing some coding on the fly to do this. Um, so sorry if this took a while, but um, we have some connectivity eigenvectors computed. So what we did was we took the connectivity matrix. We did an eigenvector uh, an eigen decomposition. So we got the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors from the matrix, and then we just viewed that we did this kind of mapping of the um, of the brain regions to the surface vertices so that we could visualize in this case, we just looked at the first three eigenvectors of the connectivity matrix. Um, so this is what connectivity matrix eigenvectors are, right? Um, and the type, the kind of thing. So this, we, we see a very expected and very predictable, predictable pattern in the first, um, the first two at least, which is the the first eigenvector. Any matrix that you, any matrix that you. Uh, you do an eigen decomposition of the first eigenvector is going to be a, a uniform sign, and you, generally people think of it as like the, the the mean. Okay, so so we've got all positive, global kind of globally positive um, values. Our second eigenvector. So when you, when one way to think about um, eigenvectors of graphs is that they they kind of they 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 cut a graph or a network a lot. On its kind of um, like optimal cut points, or its kind of uh, its bottlenecks. So in this case, as we saw from the matrix, the uh, the the big the biggest kind of segregation of the structure in this matrix is the, is into the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere, right? Because we have this highly interconnected left hemisphere block, and this highly interconnected right hemisphere block. And a, a small number of connections between the two of them. Some of the other connectivity matrices that we've looked at, there's been more of these um, these uh, uh, cross hemispheric connections. But this one, this Cocomac derived one, is just a small number of um, hemispheric homolog connections. So it's like left block, right block. So when we do our eigen v eigen decomposition, the second eigenvector that comes up does exactly that. It splits our left and right, and how that is kind of represented in terms of the magnitude of the eigenvector is that you have um, it it go it is, it is the sign change, so it's kind of negative weight negative loading and positive loading, right? So that's why I ch chose the uh, the red blue heat map there, and then as you as you move up, so it's going it's going to become a little bit harder to see with um, like choosing the right view, but maybe if we try lateral view for this one as well. Then we're going to see some more essentially spatial frequency patterns that will relate to the uh, still relate to the spatial structure of the of the graph, but like higher order um, like frequency components of the of the matrix. So that's what connectivity eigenvectors are. They're showing you the 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 spatial frequency components of the of the network. And the second part of your question is like, what is this thing harmonic brain modes? Well, this thing that we're doing with the eigenvectors, this is in this is uh, um, in some areas of science and some areas of particular kind of physical theory. These are thought of as like harmonic, called a harmonic expansion. Um, it's the same. It, it's a similar type of thing as uh, spherical harmonic expansions from. Laplace operators on that are kind of defined on a on a spherical or or a, um, other kind of geodesic manifolds, um, and the the uh, eigenvectors are the called the, the harmonic functions. So so this idea of like harmonic brain modes is to take the connectivity structure of the brain and think about the components of the connectivity matrix as the um, Kind of basis functions of brain organization, basis functions of neural activity. There's a lot to it. There's a lot of interesting work on this area. Hussein, who may be on the call, um, is uh, working on this in my group, and um, we're super interested in this kind of stuff. But yeah, practically speaking, you take the connectivity matrix and you just do Ike, and then take a look at the spatial structure of the components. Okay, long answer for you there, Justin. 
All right, I'm going to move quickly through an fMRI tutorial, and then we're going to call it a day. So here's my fMRI tutorial here. Now, um, we have a different perspective that we're taking on the dynamics in the following tutorial. We're going to, the connectivity, we're going to think of the same. Um, so the connectivity, let me just show you what I just did. I'm importing a bunch of TVB stuff. Um, the connectivity we're using is from this kind of rather famous um, study by Hackman & Co, which I actually highlighted earlier on. We also have a functional connectivity matrix from the same guys. It's using the desikin kiliani parcellation, 66 node parcellation. Um, so these aren't the best ways of plotting it, but basically, um, yeah, and this, it's got this kind of flipping of the order between the left and the right hemisphere. Um, but basically, this is our functional connectivity matrix. This is our anatomical connectivity matrix. And we're interested in uh, in doing a simulation using this as the input that generates something close to this. Now, so that's the network part. The next thing is, so this is just the correlation between the empirical and the functional connectivity. Uh, the, the dynamics part is um, a bit different to the things we've talked about so far. We talked a lot about Janssen RIP models um, and this kind of, um, these uh, oscillatory neural population models that have multiple multiple subpopulations, excitatory inhibitory components and so on. Um, the model that these folks have pursued um, as, a, as, a, as a simplified model of the fluctuations that you see in the, on a slow time scale in fMRI is even simpler than those two node um, uh, Wilson-Cowan excitatory inhibitory populations, for example. It's just one population in here. So it's one excitatory neural population. And what we're looking at is fluctuations in the activity of this single, what we call a synaptic gating variable. Right? The equations are given here. We have a sigmoidal activation function that's kind of similar to our sigmoid that we saw before. Um, we have a connectivity matrix coming in here. Don't worry about the equations per se, but what I do want to show you is this next thing, which is, um, oh, and this the, the, this model, this model here is in TVB. It's called the reduced Wang Wang model. So the thing that I want to show you is actually this thing that this is a phase diagram. So this is a way of um, representing uh, a phase plane for a one-dimensional dynamical system. And as I said, this is a this is a neural population model that only has one excitatory population, and the state variable for this excitatory population we're going to call S. So the the what what we want to know one thing that we want to know is for the values of the parameters that we saw up here, um, what are the, um, the, the stable, uh, what are the stable states of this system? Um, and a stable state is defined technically as when the derivative is, is zero. Okay, so so basically when so that's why we're plotting s by ds. Okay, so when when uh, so d, ds being the derivative of zero. So when when this thing on the y-axis is at zero, which is what we've kind of represented with this dotted line here, um, then the uh, the the neural activity is not changing. Um, it's it's kind of at a, what we call a stationary a stationary state or a fixed point state. It doesn't mean it's kind of important actually. It doesn't mean that it's there's no activity as you might think of for kind of an, an, an oscillation versus a flat line. What it means is that's the stable firing rate, although in this case it's a stable synaptic activity level. So it could be like a high activity level or a low activity level. Um, but it does be just because it's it's stationary doesn't mean that it's not um, that it's like a zero like a brain death, okay? So the phase we can kind of use this phase flow diagram to um, see 
um, varying some of the parameters. So in this case, we're varying the um, the W parameter, which is the um, uh, uh, local excitatory recurrent feedback, so kind of positive self feedback. Um, for the the uh, state variable, we can take a look at the same thing for different values of an input. Um, and again, the thing we're looking for is how many how many times do each of these individual curves, each of these curves is one parameter value. How many times does one of these curves intersect zero? Because the place that intersects zero is again that's like a, the 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 um, the kind of default state of the of the system for that that value of the parameters. And when there's multiple intersections with zero for one parameter set, then we we have the scenario that we call multi-stability which is exactly what it what it sounds like. It's like there's multiple stable, there's multiple values of the state variable for which um, the kind of system is happy to be at, okay? So you can see there's a few cases in these lines where there's actually a multi-stability, where we kind of go basically go, go past zero, intersect, go down, and then go up again. We have two intersections with the zero line but most of them, there's only one stable state, okay? So this is a system that represents a summary, a kind of simplified description of excitatory neural population activity that um, in most parameter regimes is, bi is, is monostable, but in some cases is bistable slash multistable, right? That's the basic starting point. Uh, so the next bit I'm actually going to, so this, this next bit elaborates on this. I'm actually not gonna run this now, I'm just gonna go to the figure. So this is, I'm pointing out a similar thing, but in a slightly different way. This is the maximum firing rate as a function of, in this case, we're varying this thing called the global coupling. And it says maximum firing rate across the, the network. So this is now actually a network simulation. If we just kind of zoom up and show what we're actually doing here, we're actually doing the thing that we did in the previous tutorial with TVB. We're going to initialize a simulator object with the connectivity and the coupling and the integration and all these things. Um, so kind of run a full network simulation. Like the con here, this is going to be the Hackman connectivity. So 66 nodes there, okay. Um, so this function is like uh, we had on the previous uh, tutorial, we had our kind of simulation function. This thing takes uh, about half an hour to run, so I'm not gonna run this, but what we're seeing in the output here is the um, the maximum number of spikes, okay? Um, as in oh, sort of spikes um, per unit time, as in firing rate. So, <clears throat> and, uh, and, and we're, we're looking at it, it over, it's uh, or like 30 different simulation runs with different values of this parameter, the global coupling. And what we do, what we see is like we crank up the global coupling. So each of these dots, this is kind of saying, this is what the, um, this is equivalent to when we were thinking about the, the zero crossings in this, in this uh, phase plane, this is the, these are the kind of preferential um, steady states of the system, right? So, so as we crank up our global coupling, which you can think of as kind of a temperature parameter, um, the, we move after a little bit from this situation where we have one, it's not actually zero, it's actually just a very low value. So we call this a low firing rate um, regime. And then, and then we move into this thing. So this, these, this phenomenon here where the, the uh, uh, qualitative behavior switches, this is called a bifurcation. Um, so the qualitative behavior switches in that we have this thing, we call it a loss of stability of the low um, firing rate state and the emergence of a multi-stability, which you can think of again, analogous to the zero crossings. It's like there's two different values of the um, firing rate that the, the nodes in the network are kind of happy to be at. They'll either, they'll either be at the low firing rate state or they'll be at a high firing rate state. The actual value of the maximum of the high firing rate increases, but at any given value of these two things, there's one of these two points that most, that basically all of the neural, all of the neural populations, all of the nodes in the network are gonna sit at, 
okay? So we crank up the temperature even more, or the global coupling even more. We have a second bifurcation, and at that point, our low energy or low activity firing rate state just disappears, and now we only have high, high activity states. So this phenomenon, this uh, uh, well, these two bifurcations, but also this this kind of qualitative shift of behavior, this is something that there's it's kind of a general idea in this uh, line of work that interesting stuff happens when you're close to one to a bifurcation point, either just before it or just after it, um, and that's the rationale behind um, the comparison with the. Um, empirical functional connectivity, which is kind of showing here. So this is exactly the same thing, like cranking up through the global global coupling, and then looking at the uh, simulation, the the correlation between the simulated functional connectivity and the empirical functional connectivity. That's what the uh, the blue dots are here. The um, the green ones are the correlation between the simulated functional connectivity and the uh, the simulated in the but no, the, the simulated functional connectivity and the empirical structural connectivity. But the main thing we're interested in here is the blue blue one here. They both show the same behavior. It doesn't really matter. Don't worry about both of them. But think about what goes on over here. So this dotted line here, this is what we had back here when we were doing our bifurcation diagrams, kind of roughly around here, so where our second bifurcation is occurring. So and then we kind of fall off a, a hill here. So basically, the idea is that the, the correlation between the empirical and the simulated data is maximized around about the point of this system bifurcation. And the interpretation of that, and you should think hard about what interpretations mean in this kind of context, but the interpretation is that the brain, the brain sits at this, um, at this critical, at this region of criticality, where uh, again we're kind of close to a bifurcation point, and this is where things like the correlation uh, correlation patterns in the fMRI data can best be produced by the model. Um, this is the functional connectivity data that's simulated, which is kind of fairly good for the. Um, for the within hemisphere, actually, it's not so good for the cross, cross hemispheric connections. But honestly, these models are never very good for the cross hemispheric connections. And um, yeah, this is the distribution of the of the edge weights as well. So we have like they're reasonably well distributed, even though the empirical one is a little bit smoother and more smeared out. The simulated FC values are a little bit more peaked. And yeah, and we can do a we can take a single node. So this is kind of reproducing a figure from the paper. We can take a single node, and say, uh, kind of, basically take one car one one column from the simulated and the inf and the empirical functional connectivity matrix and kind of line them up next to each other as a bar plot and, and think about how how similar these profiles are. Like the the argument here from the paper in general is that actually these two are quite similar, um, ish, you know. <laughs> but uh, it's uh, it's it's interesting to take the uh, individual nodes and kind of plot them this way. You can, you can kind of see a little bit more structure when you look at the negative and the positive correlations. Cool. Uh, so that was just super quick run through resting state. Um, hopefully. Hopefully that was useful. I mean, I know it was super quick, but um, any questions on that from anyone? All right, guys, it's been a blast. Thank you for listening to your imaging connectomics and whole brain modeling. Um, thank you for paying attention and, and being around for the um, the first week of the KCNI and I Summer School 2021. Looking forward to seeing you guys back at the Crowdcast sessions and in the Gather Town and on the Slack um, for the first half of next week. And uh, have yourselves a fantastic weekend and see some of you in the Gather Town maybe um, in the next half an hour.
Bye, guys.